would like to welcome you to today's uh, webinar. But before we start, I wanted to go through a few logistical um, items. Um, everyone has been muted on the line, so if you have any questions, please type them in the chat section located in the uh, go to training uh, control panel. We have representatives from Ontario Power Authority, Enersource, Hydro One Brampton, and Ontario's uh, demand response aggregators who are NNARC, ECS Grid, and Rodin Power who are online today um, who will answer all of your questions. So if you come across any issues throughout the webinar, please send a direct message to myself at TRCA host within the chat section. So let's begin. On behalf of Partners in Project Green, again, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly series of green technology webinars. Partners in Project Green is a growing, growing community of businesses working together to green their bottom line by creating an internationally recognized eco-business zone around Toronto Pearson that's known for its competitive, high performance and eco-friendly business climate. Through these monthly, monthly webinars, we hope to bring the latest technologies, programs and tools to the comfort of your office um, and provide a format to ask questions that will help you discover the right solutions for your operations. Partners in Project Green offers many resources to help companies along their journey to sustainability, and I encourage you to visit our website to learn more about our programs, training, events, and much more at www.partnersinprojectgreen.com. So this afternoon, we are exploring energy conservation through the Demand Response Program. We're very fortunate to have Graham Smith from the Ontario Power Authority calling in from Toronto to lead a discussion. Mr. Smith has five years of experience working in the Ontario electricity market. Currently, he is the industrial business manager for the OPA, working with industrial transmission connected um, facilities to identify energy efficiency projects. Mr. Smith has been in this role and with the OPA for just over a year. Prior to this, he worked with uh, he worked on the demand response program for two and a half years. So, Graham, if you can take it on, that'd be great. All right. Thanks, uh, Alex, for, for organizing this, and uh, thanks to Hydro One Brampton and Enersource as well for the, um, for the invitation. Um, my goal is to um, hopefully generate some interest with, uh, within the business community uh, online uh, to uh, at least have some conversations about um, demand response and to help uh, increase the, uh, the participation in this program and, and to, to make it, uh, its success continue on. Um, obviously, what I want to do is to give a little bit of information about um, uh, why the program exists and, and what some of the benefits uh, might be to, uh, to your business for, for joining. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll sort of go ahead and, and, and kick it right off. Um, what, uh, what I wanted to mention, uh, if you happen to be uh, reading the news yesterday, was that um, Yesterday was the the tenth anniversary of the blackout that uh, we had across uh, Ontario and and uh, a lot of the eastern uh, seaboard uh, in August uh, two thousand three. So it's kind of a of a of a timely uh, occurrence for for this webinar. Um, at at the time we had um, uh, grid constraints and and uh, su supply and and demand. Um, balance issues and and that's part of um, the reason why why this program exists uh, today uh, to, to help alleviate those those issues so um, my presentation sort of um, starts off at uh, at kind of a, a high level and uh, I'll, I'll sort of quickly go through that and then get uh, a little more specific into demand response which is um, why uh, you're you're all on the call today to hear more about that program, and uh, you can feel free to uh, send your uh, questions off to uh, to Alex as we go through it. So, as I said, I just sort of went through the agenda there uh, briefly, but um, as a response to to the the aging grid system, um, the Ontario Power Authority and and the Ministry of Energy. Uh, need to develop a solution to modernize the, the electricity system in our province uh, to make it more reliable and uh, and smarter, quite frankly, moving forward uh, with the technologies um, that are available today to avoid um, blackouts that are that are very uh, costly to our economy. So um, within um, within this program, we have um, 
uh, conservation is, is one of the main uh, ways to, to make the, uh, the energy system um, more reliable. So um, part of the goals are to have uh, 7,100 megawatts of peak demand reduction and 28 terawatt hours of energy reduction by 2030. So we're only partway through um, those, uh, those goals as right, right now. And uh, we want to make conservation the first resource in system planning. Um, at, uh, at the OPA, um, we, we see that um, conservation can be um, a cheaper method of, of, uh, of um, balancing the, the grid. It's not as costly sometimes as building expensive power plants. So the, uh, the greenest uh, and cheapest megawatt is the one that, uh, that we can serve. And um, we work with um, the local distribution companies, such as Hydro One Brampton and Enersource, to uh, to achieve uh, these goals. So, um, what uh, we're looking at here is just sort of a, a basic um, um, customer segmentation slide. Uh, we have different programs that that reach out to different. Um, uh, business sectors, there's smaller, small commercial programs, there's consumer programs. Some of you may be involved in uh, Peak Saver Plus where um, your, your air conditioning at home is uh, scaled back a few degrees when, when the grid uh, is uh, under a bit of strain. Um, but what we're going to be focusing on is the uh, industrial programs, uh, which includes demand response. Um, there's also um, equipment replacement programs that that you can uh, discuss with your uh, local distribution company, more of a, a long-term energy reduction solution as opposed to demand response, which is sort of a, a short-term energy curtailment type uh, solution. So within the industrial sector specifically, um, we have the transmission connected um, class A um, large uh, consumers, so that's about 2,000 megawatts of the grid's um, consumption. And our grid uh, kind of fluctuates uh, around 20,000 megawatts. Uh, um, it goes uh, up and down. The, I believe the blackout uh, we had in 2003, we were uh, having uh, demand spikes uh, close to 30,000 megawatt, megawatts. Um, but uh, since uh, 2008 and 2009, that's uh, come down quite significantly. Um, so transmission-connected sites are the ones that are connected directly through the IESO. Um, now, the other distribution-connected um, um, facilities, um, probably like the ones that, that you operate, go through a Hydro One Brampton or an Enersource. So as you can see, there's about 500 to 1,000 um, me megawatts of uh, Class A large distribution connected customers, and then a significant amount of uh, smaller ones. Um, so this uh, slide um, shows what what the grid looks like, um, basically as a percentage of the year. So um, basically, what what uh, it's trying to show is that it's only a very small percentage of the year that we get the large demand spikes. So it's the uh, the very few days of the year when we're reaching 40 plus uh, degrees with with the humidity. That's when we have the the large spikes on our grid, and it's uh, sort of an inefficient and not cost effective way to, to operate the grid to have all of our generation resources firing at 100 percent all the time. So what we try to do is is stagger and and basically have our our generation resources mimic the uh, the shape of the grid as, as best as we we possibly can, and fire on the the peaking resources and and uh, programs like demand response on those hot afternoons when uh, when the when the uh, demand is really spiking. So in order to do this, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, um, part of our goal was to modernize the electricity grid. Uh, and make it more reliable and, and smarter. So the smart meters are, are a key to that uh, as it uh, enables us to, to track um, uh, the uh, consumption at, at a site at, uh, at uh, a, a very small interval level and, 
and uh, that's actually how we're able to track the uh, the uh, success of demand response so quickly as we can see the the energy come off the grid in, in real time and that's how you can work with your aggregator as well to to structure uh, a plan to to participate in demand response and this is um, just basically uh, a snapshot of, of what an average week would look like in the province as you can see there's uh, significant, significant increases in demand um, as the workday begins and then we hit our spike typically late in the afternoon and then as the business day comes to a close the uh, electricity comes off the grid overnight and uh, as you note on Saturday October 15th Sunday October 16th that uh, weekends we don't have as much demand on on the grid so that's why um, the demand response program is is only for Mondays to Fridays they are the the higher uh, demand periods of time so to get um, a little more in-depth exactly what demand response is as I mentioned before it's initiative to help us reduce the peaks that um, can can create uh, grid instability and um, basically uh, uh, a company would would sign up with a with a commitment to reduce X number of of kilowatts from from their baseline and to be on on call essentially for a demand response event so you'll see it says 100 hours per year during potential peak hours so um, and that's a 1600 hour program so if we were to look at every single day of the year the, the window of, of noon to 9 p.m. Um, that would be the 1600 hours where you're on call and the most that you would ever be asked to participate is 100 hours which is 25 dem demand response events so so I'm throwing a lot of numbers around but each demand response event would be a, a four-hour reduction so 25, if all 25 events were called, that would be 100 hours of demand response uh, activations. Um, just to sort of alleviate uh, uh, con the concerns you, you may have, um, this, this year so far we have had uh, three activations, um, each at four hours. So that would be a total of, of 12 hours of, of demand response that's being called. Uh, in 2012, we had um, five activations, which is 20 hours. And in 2011, we had 11 activations. And in 2010, we had 10 activations. So um, in recent years, we've been having five to, to 10 demand response events per year. And they typically occur on, on the hot days of summer when the demand is, uh, is uh, really spiking. So the... Uh, Ontario Power Authority um, delivers the program, but um, with uh, aggregators who are our partners, um, essentially uh, we contract with aggregators to deliver 10 megawatt blocks. So when we call a demand response event, we rely on the aggregators to deliver 10 megawatts of reduction to the grid. They in turn uh, contract with um, with the uh, the business community and um, tailor solutions with uh, each individual customer uh, to determine how they can participate in this program. Uh, essentially, how can they reduce their energy consumption for a four-hour uh, uh, increment of time? So, what's in it? Um, the the most important part um, for you on the phone is what's what's in it for you, and. Um, it can be a, a very uh, uh, rich program. Um, I encourage you to, to uh, have a chat um, with the aggregators to uh, really determine what, what can be made through the, through the program uh, monetarily. But um, most of the payments are made for being on standby. So <clears throat> uh, even if a, a very few number of events this year, three events uh, so far are called, most of your payments, um, generally about 90% uh, of them, come through the standby payment. So uh, you would still receive a check for the, the, the winter months that would, would be fairly significant 
even though you may not be asked to, to participate. And then on top of that, when you are called and when you are asked to uh, deliver your, your, uh, your reduction, uh, you'd also get the utilization payment on, on top of that. So um, typically the, the utilization payment uh, is about 10% uh, of, of the, uh, the overall uh, pie, but uh, it really depends how many uh, events are called per year and also the biggest factor is how well uh, you are able to uh, curtail your, your your demand when the events are called. That's uh, obviously the, the number one factor in, in what you're going to uh, be paid through the program. <clears throat> so the as I sort of mentioned before, the, the role of the aggregator is to, to market the program. They're the one out there uh, talking to customers and, and finding ways for them to participate. Uh, they've they're the ones that uh, manage the activations. So when we call a demand response event, um, you wouldn't be hearing from the Ontario Power Authority uh, directly. We send notifications to Enernoc, Enershift, and ECS uh, specifying the time that we would like to have a demand response event. And they, in turn, uh, have a notification system set up with their customers to let them know when the demand response event will occur. Um, they are in charge of uh, managing your payments and also discussing what uh, risk, if any, uh, you may have in, in entering this, uh, this program. And um, they can sometimes come up with a unique uh, solution for you. Um, there are many different ways to participate uh, in the program. They've uh, worked with many different types of customers, so in many cases they can find uh, um, some some ways to participate that uh, y you might have uh, have overlooked. And um, when we hear from <clears throat> the two uh, uh, customers that are on online, uh, I'm sure they can provide some insight as well in, in, into how they were able to find ways to participate in the program. Uh, so just to get back to the the activations. Um, one of the other uh, uh, Ontario um, uh, government agencies, the IESO, uh, they are managing the grid and watching the grid in real time. So they are the ones that um, would uh, would uh, essentially tell the OPA to trigger the, the demand response event. Um, and we provide a minimum of two and a half hours of um, of uh, notice. Um, we try to try to provide day ahead notice when when possible, but um, a minimum of two two and a half hours prior to the event, and the events always last uh, four hours, never longer, never shorter. And the way we we measure the reduction is um, how much uh, demand comes off relative to the baseline of the facility. So the baseline is um, something, again, you may want to have a conversation with, with the aggregator about. Um, but essentially, it's your, your average uh, electricity demand within the, the program hours. So if we're talking about uh, noon to, to 9 PM, you may have uh, fluctuating demand depending on what, what type of business you operate. But the baseline would be uh, essentially the average of the past 10 business days. So um, if we were talking about today, we would go back to the, the two Thursdays ago. Every business uh, uh, day between two Thursdays ago and today would be used to calculate the baseline and, and to uh, measure your performance in a demand response event. Um, so this is um, a shot of, uh, of the, the province's uh, grid on a demand response day on July 21st, 2011. So we can see what um, what impact this program and also um, the global adjustment uh, high five. Um, that's that's a, sort of a different program for, for Class A customers. But we can see what kind of an impact uh, those two programs had on um, reducing the, the peak of, uh, of a very hot day a couple of years ago. Uh, as, I, as I said, uh, again, the, uh, the baseline is uh, 
um, essentially what you would have used if you were not uh, curtailing. And depending on where your facility is, uh, a weather adjustment may be applied to your baseline. So um, essentially if, if, uh, if you're running well above your baseline uh, on a day of an event because all of the air conditioning is on your facility, there may be a weather adjustment available uh, for you to sort of reduce your, your demand uh, in the event. And um, the question that, um, that every, every customer has is, uh, well, many of them, first of all, don't think that, that they have an opportunity to participate because um, business needs to keep going. But um, the opportunities that, um, that, that can be found are shifting production to off-peak hours, um, not necessarily for the entire facility, and, and uh, that's also something I should note. We're, we're not necessarily looking for uh, a full facility to be shut down. We're just looking for you know, whatever, whatever is possible, um, just a portion of, of the electricity. So if there's a process that, uh, that doesn't necessarily need to run, can that be curtailed for, for four hours and uh, work off of, um, of inventory or work off of um, work in process down the line? Uh, or, or if it's a batch process, if you have a, a big stockpile that you're able to continue to, to ship to your, your suppliers and, and delay um, processing another batch, um, use of backup generation uh, can be um, tricky. Uh, it, uh, it does need to have a, a CFA if it's, uh, if it's a diesel generator. Um, it can be costly to get this. Natural gas generators are, are typically a better fit, but again, you should speak with your aggregator uh, to, to determine if, if the generator that you have on site would be uh, able to participate. And then managing uh, air conditioning, lighting loads, and refrigeration loads. Um, a lot of, uh, of, of companies and uh, Algoma Orchards, who's on the call, uh, they they were able to find a successful curtailment solution with uh, uh, reducing some of their refrigeration loads at their facility. So your opportunity is to to help us um, stabilize the the power system and prevent uh, the blackouts, and uh, get paid while doing it, and also uh, get a better understanding of your energy usage. So Alex, um, you may have uh, received some questions. Well. I was going through my participation. If so, let me know. Otherwise, um, you can sort of pass it along to the next presenter. Perfect. Thank you so much, Graham. That was really a great overview. I don't have any questions. It was fantastic what you provided. So I'm just going to wait a few seconds to see if anyone has any questions. But please note that Graham will be on the line until the very end of the webinar and will also be available then for any questions. Um, so we don't have anything right now. So we'll go right into the next step. Uh, we actually are very fortunate to have two um, case studies um, available on our call today. Um, one of them is Algoma Orchards, and we're very fortunate to have Ken Ferguson joining us um, this afternoon. Um, and Ken is actually the operations manager for the juice plant at Algoma Orchards, um, and we'll be writing his experience of participating in DR3. And he's actually calling in from Newcastle, Ontario this afternoon. So, Ken, I'm just going to quickly unmute you here. And um, there we go. OK. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Yes. I am the operations manager here at Algoma Orchards. And uh, my background is an industrial electrician by trade. Uh, our packing plant began operations in our new facility here in the summer of 2009. And we package apples for all the major grocery chains. It's done with one of the most sophisticated lines in North America at approximately 10,000 cases per day. Our juice facility began operation in October of 2009. When we fresh press and pasteurize juice for bottling and bulk sales. And we have the, the ability to process 400,000 liters of juice per week. We began participating with demand response in July 2010. Uh, and once we decided we were going to participate, Enernock came to our facility. We went around the plant and recorded all of our electrical equipment, uh, 
noting horsepower, wattage. We made up a complete list. Once we did this, we sat down and evaluated which equipment could be shut down, uh, which was essential and not able to shut down. And uh, for us, typical equipment to be shutting down, compressors, fans, hydraulic pumps, circulation pumps, uh, boilers, water recirculating system, battery chargers, uh, assorted production equipment, and of course, as Graham mentioned, our uh, refrigerated cooling areas. A typical uh, demand response event for us starts with a phone call and an email, and it usually is four to six hours ahead of time, sometimes even 24 hours ahead of time, that they will let us know that we are on standby. And uh, when that happens, I notify all the managers in the plant to let them know that we're on standby and there's a possibility that we will be doing a curtailment. Um, they also let us know the, the six-hour window that they're looking at slotting us into so that we can, uh, you know, plan accordingly. Usually, approximately four hours before the event, we're given notice, although it, it can come up to about two to two and a half hours before the event. They tell us the start time and the end time. Uh, always remind you to look at what pieces of equipment you're going to curtail. Um, uh, and they also remind you that you need to start shutting down up to 15 minutes beforehand. I typically have my people start 30 minutes beforehand um, because we are able to monitor on screen through Enternock exactly how much we've been reducing. And uh, I've resorted at times when we needed to where I turned off the air conditioning in the offices, uh, employee uh, lunch rooms, uh, turning out lights and computers, whatever I needed to to get that last little bit if it was a slightly busy time for us. Uh, you can track all your performances over the years. Um, we are assigned to a DR3 program. Uh, we currently take 350 kilowatts off the grid during an event. Um, we've just made arrangements to actually increase that by another 50 kilowatts. Uh, probably one of the most important questions that most of you are wondering is what about production? Well, we have the ability to shift our production uh, to off-peak hours when it occurs. We haven't had more than five demand responses in a year. Um, and, you know, the other question that I get asked a lot is, you know, is it financially for us, is it good? Well, we recoup approximately 6% of our ad annual hydro bill through demand response. So uh, the owners here feel that that's significant. The one other benefit that comes out of this, and, and everybody is, is really uh, looking for it now, is that we are able to tell all of our customers about our green initiative, participating in de demand response. Uh, we have a water recycling program where we can recycle gray water. We also recycle cardboard and plastic. And all of our apples, after we have pressed them, go for composting. So in, in all those ways, we're giving back to the community. That's pretty much what I have, if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, Ken. That was really great. I, I don't have any questions, actually, um, but I actually have one. So was there a bit of a transition period for everyone to get accustomed to uh, getting used to what they need to do very in a short amount of time? We, uh, we actually practiced a couple times ahead of time before we ever had a demand response. Um, the first time we didn't actually shut anything down, we just, I walked through with each manager uh, what piece of equipment was respons they were responsible for in their area to do a shutdown. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, that, that took a, a probably three hours uh, of time to do that. And uh, then the next time we did it, we actually did a demand response and just practiced for one hour to have everything go down so everybody got used to what they were stopping and then starting back up in the times that they could start back up. I should also mention that the amount of time that it takes to get involved in this program is, is 
very minor. I, I had less than eight hours time with dealing between uh, enter knock and, and the recording of the equipment in our plant and all that type of thing. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was really great. Um, I don't have any other questions, but again, you provided a great example of what uh, DR3 can do for an organization. Um, we do actually have an, an additional case study, and we have um, Jeff Gilbert joining us from Huntsville, Ontario, um, from Kimberly Clark. And Jeff is the financial manager and environmental coordinator for energy at Kimberly Clark. Let me just unmute you here, Jeff. There we go. Hi, Alex. There you go. Perfect. Thanks. Good. Uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to today's call. We have a great story to tell. Uh, we're big advocates of both uh, DR3 and I think Graham mentioned a uh, high five program. Um, basically, our call to action was as we did major restructuring of our operations uh, about two years ago, we, uh, we realized that we paid the highest electricity rates among uh, the 23 uh, Kimberly Clark North American facilities. We're a 365 day a year. 24-7 operation. We uh, produce facial tissue for North America, uh, pocket pack, and uh, bath tissue. And uh, essentially, we decided as a management team that we needed to go in, uh, go big into these programs in order to drive the benefit of, uh, of uh, making our business viable from a, from a cost structure perspective. Um, Essentially, we, uh, it was, uh, as per the previous presenter, uh, we, we, our aggregator is Enternoc, uh, extremely uh, easy to work with. Uh, uh, we first sat down and, and uh, we had to understand the load of all of our assets. Uh, our, our largest load is our paper machine, and uh, our, our original uh, call to action was to, uh, to uh, curtail uh, essentially the tissue machine and uh, through further iterations we're now uh, curtailing our uh, converting equipment for the uh, for both uh, for all demand response initiatives um, so right now we're curtailing about 5.3 megawatts of our of our load which is about uh, seven and a half uh, our annual payments are north of 325,000 for demand response program um, the big benefit that came to us is uh, what, what are we going to do with this time where we're curtailed? And uh, a little bit of outside the box thinking uh, drove us to uh, to uh, develop maintenance plans for this curtailment time. And uh, essentially, we look at it that we're getting paid to do our preventative maintenance. We have a pit crew mentality where we have uh, jobs that can be completed in the four-hour increments. And uh, we deliver those jobs during the demand response outages, and uh, further allows us to do some training of our operations and, and maintenance staff during that time as need be. So uh, the first, the first uh, uh, real challenge for us was to drive the mindset within our management team that uh, this was indeed a good uh, business uh, business plan to uh, curtail the equipment and uh, to uh, impact our cost structure favorably. Uh, as far as notice, we're uh, generally we get a day ahead notice. Uh, very rarely it slips to the two and a half hours before the outage. Uh, we have a team that springs into action and uh, it takes us about an hour to curtail uh, all of our equipment, to take our equipment down in preparation for the four hour outage. Um, and at the end of the day, we've moved our electricity cost by a minimum of 25%, which has been very significant with our goal to, uh, to basically uh, uh, protect and uh, maintain the jobs that we have up here in Huntsville and to, uh, with an overall goal to uh, uh, expand the facility. And uh, if you have any questions, I am more than willing to, uh, to answer them. 
Great. Thank you so much, Jess. That was really great. Um, I don't have any questions again, but we do have one more presenter. Uh, we have Jennifer Taves, who's the Project Manager for Communications and Engagement at Partners in Project Green, and she will be providing a quick overview of the Smart Shift Challenge which is um, a, a really great incentive program for uh, people who would like to participate in demand response. So let me just unmute um, Jennifer. Just there we go. There you go. We can hear you now. Hi, Alex. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining the call. So uh, yes, Partners in Project Green thinks that uh, Demand Response is a, a, a really wonderful program for businesses, uh, a great way to uh, participate in, in helping our electricity grid become more reliable and become more sustainable, as well as you know get some uh, a good financial incentive for, con for participating in the program. Uh, so we really wanted to take it a little bit further and, and provide some recognition benefits to the companies who are standing up and, and taking an environmental leadership role through participation in the demand response program. So we, uh, together with Enersource and Hydro One Brampton, created the Smart Shift Challenge, a partnership that pays. And really the idea here is that we'll recognize businesses for taking leadership by participating in the Demand Response 3 program. So as we've been discussing, uh, there are some really wonderful opportunities to get paid to reduce peak load by participating in the DR3 program. And based on that Kimberly Clark presentation, I'm going to have to change my average returns here because uh, that's a pretty uh, pretty penny that they're receiving each and every year. Uh, you, know, so you obviously have seen the, the really wonderful financial benefits that a business can receive for participating in DR3. So the challenge for us is how can we reduce energy consumption during peak times through the demand response challenge, and we're going to aim to hit a, a conservative goal of two megawatts in Mississauga and one megawatt in Brampton during this time, and the challenge is running until December 31st, 2014. So uh, a lot of the benefits have already been uh, spoken to around DR3, but some of the benefits that uh, are involved with the Smart Shift Challenge is that we'll give you some media recognition for participation in the program. We'll also provide some on-site communication tools so you can communicate your participation to your stakeholders, to your clients, so they and to your employees, so everyone knows the action that you're taking uh, towards environmental sustainability. And we'll also recognize outstanding achievers. So everyone who meets 100% of their curtailment requirements during the challenge timeline will be uh, rewarded and recognized for that at the end of the challenge uh, timeline. And of course, you get that satisfaction uh, from knowing that you're contributing to the economic and envir environmental performance of your business. So it's a very, very simple process uh, to get started with the Smart Shift Challenge. You can simply contact Partners in Project Green, uh, and we'll put you in touch with the aggregators so you can start that process to signing on to the program and seeing what a good fit is for your organization. And then we'll continue on to provide you with all of the recognition tools that I spoke about. So you can learn more about the program by visiting our website. It's an easy one just right there, www.partnersinprojectgreen.com backslash smart shift, or simply reach out to me and I'd be happy to have a conversation with you about uh, what the, what's involved and how you can get started with the program. Uh, so I did want to keep it brief, but I am uh, definitely open and available for any questions. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. I did make a note to everyone, so we have representatives from OPA, local utilities, and aggregators online to answer any of your questions. And nothing has come through yet. Seems like everything has been very thorough. Um, I'm going to unmute Graham as well to see if there's anything that you would like to say. Um, sure. Um, yeah. I guess um, when, uh, as from from a customer's perspective. I think that um, this time of year is uh, is a great time to to think about getting involved and in, and in setting up those meetings um, with the aggregators. Um, right now, we're sort of coming out of um, the event season, um, so when when you talk to an aggregator <clears throat> and start to identify ways to participate and 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 go through the the process of of signing agreement. You probably wouldn't um, actually be enrolled into the program until the fall or, or maybe you know October, or November, December, um, which gives you a great uh, opportunity to 
first of all, as, as Ken said, um, get some practice with um, with um, with with your curtailment plan, and uh, and additionally start to um, see some of the revenues that um, that will be coming through. Um, it's uh, it isn't um, impossible to have have an event in the winter. We have had uh, a few in in November, just with um, some some so, sort of supply side uh, issues. But um, typically, we see most of the events happen in June, July, August. So it's kind of uh, nice to be able to you know take the the first uh, check or two into your your supervisor and and show them the the dollars that are being earned um, through this program um, prior to the real um, um, crunch time in, in summer when we start to see events happen a little more frequently. So um, from from a, from a business perspective, I think now is a, is a great time to, to start having those conversations and, and start engaging and, uh, and talking about ways to participate in this program. Thank you so much, Graham. I'm actually going to open the line to um, Uzair Abek, who is from um, Enersource as well, and open up to the um, aggregators who are online, William Grove, um, Michael Parker from Enernoc, and then we also have Peter Fox, just to see if they have any last um, uh, comments. We actually, if, if you guys... I do have a question. Um, so, there are there any examples that can be provided for DR3 using standby generation? Uh, Graham, you touched on this briefly, uh, but a concrete example example would be nice. So, uh, sure, I I can do one. It's uh, Willie Grohl from Rodan. Great, thanks, William. Um, yeah, we have a um, a food manufacturer and distributor in the um, sort of southwest Ontario area had a lot of cold storage in their warehouse um, and went through the process of cleaning up um, two diesel engines for um, you know enrollment into demand response and you know first step was to you know was to put a um, catalytic reduction uh, system or an SCR system onto the engines to take the NOx um, levels and diesel particulate levels down to um, satisfactory um, satisfactory levels for the Ministry of Environment to uh, issue a certificate of approval or what's now called an environmental compliance approval um, to be enrolled in demand response and that's different from the normal certificate of approval you might just have for an emergency standby uh, generator. Um, what also happened, happened in this case, because of the size, it needed to be an environmental screening or an environmental assessment done. And so um, the consultants took them through the um, environmental assessment process, which all of the businesses in their area, um, it wasn't an industrial park, so it was relatively easy to, uh, you know, to do. We're given the opportunity to comment on the fact that these people wanted to run their generator you know, effectively during the day for non-emergency you know, use. Then, the SCR system was add, added, modeling was done, um, and um, eventually they, uh, the paperwork came through that this customer was, <laughs> excuse me, was, um, you know, able to uh, participate in demand response. Now the process can be a lot easier for natural gas engines, um, but you know it uh, it still is uh, a similar process in terms of you know, permitting and approvals, depending on the size of the engine. And then the, you know, the, the big question is how much will it cost to, uh, you know, to do it and what kind of revenue is what drives the, the ultimate decision. So, you know, we at Rodan have worked with a variety of suppliers in that space that, um, you know, could, you know, have, who have done the work and been successful in getting, uh, you know, getting these engines approved and, into demand response, and would be happy to uh, to talk to any customer that might be interested in in doing it. It's a bit of a process, and does cost some money, but you know it can be uh, can be lucrative. And at the end of the day, if you've got a generator, you um, you know you can then demonstrate to management that we know it's going to work for at least four hours um, at a time because we're effectively testing it under real load conditions um, for the demand response events. Perfect. Thank you so much, Willie. 
Are there any last comments perhaps from Azair, from Enersource, or any of the other aggregators? Hi, Michael Parker from uh, Enernoc. Perfect, yes. So I just wanted to uh, to say uh, thank you very much to, to Algoma Orchards and to uh, to Kimberly Clark. Um, they've been really leaders in the green energy space, respective industries, and they've been absolutely fantastic uh, participants and, and demand response providers for our organization uh, over the years. So I wanted to you know, extend thank you to them. Um, and, uh, of course, um, let everyone on the line know that we are uh, definitely available to, uh, to talk, um, to do some consult consultations and, and uh, free assessments to see uh, what sort of load can be reduced and uh, give you all of the necessary tools that you would need um, to make a decision whether, uh, whether demand response is, is right for you or not, mm -hmm. um, whether it's uh, coming from generation or, or curtailment or a combination of the both. Great, thank you. And I will definitely send all the contact information in a follow-up email to all to everyone who has registered and who's online right now. Um, again, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for Graham um, for providing the presentation from OPA and to Ken Ferguson from Algoma Orchards and Jeff uh, Gilbert from Kimberly Clark all for joining and providing your story and sharing your lessons learned and, and whatnot. Uh, thank you to everyone who's participated and who's logged on. Again, if you have any questions, please email me directly, um, and I can get that information out to you. Thank you so much. Have a great okay. afternoon.